Frank Salzgeber, head of innovation venture, and we're really looking to the develop of certain technologies. And I always sh like to share this picture because what you see there is this shimmering uh, on atmosphere. And this picture is made from the ISS, uh, from our ASA astronauts. This is the atmosphere which makes life on Earth and not. And there you see all the member states. And I want to always uh, state that very clearly we work with the European Union, but we are not part of the European Union. For this reason, the UK stays a very active member state in the European Space Agency, also like Switzerland, also like uh, Norway. And the good thing is the money which uh, the government's putting in, they go in the right quota back, but later to that uh, state. When we look into space in general, this is the Milky Way, where it's about 100,000 uh, 100, light years in diameter. You have see about 200 billion stars, and that's just we. So for the people which not work here as kids to become astronaut like me, they uh, have the bad news because we are all astronauts. We're all astronauts on our spaceship called Earth, and we're rotating around the sun with 100,000 kilometers per hour and around the center of the Milky Way with 700,000 kilometers per hour. And therefore, when we're looking to green, well, the spaceship which is now traveling to the ISS tomorrow or on our Earth have the same problem. So we have to keep our spaceship in the right health. Nevertheless, and this is also what has to do when we speak about renewable, when we speak about sustainability, uh, you will not see these two rockets at the same time. We have heavy traffic, but it's not like this. On the one side, you see the Arani rocket, the, other, the Soyuz rocket, which was until last year the only carrier bringing astronauts, cosmonauts, or tigernauts uh, to the International Space Station beside the, the Chinese launcher, of course. Now we, we go with SpaceX tomorrow. But what is with the rocket which makes it so interesting? Because 80% is fuel, 70% is, is rocket, 3% is payload. So when we go on lightweight structure, uh, when we go on certain technology, space is always a driver because we have a problem. It has to be light, it has to be robust, it has to work. We cannot repair it. So a lot of technologies started in space are now brought back to space. And that was the first job, well, my last job, the last 15 years when we spoke about tech transfer. So if you have something question, <clears throat> Paul, when the Q&A will stay, we also can happy to, to connect you there. Where we bring our astronauts is the same place where Tim Peake was to the International Space Station, 100 by 100 uh, meters by 30 meters, and not far away, it's just 400 kilometers. And also what we do there, it's, it's our own habitat. And uh, the astronauts, uh, when we're looking to Tim Peake outside of the space station, which is the same physical stress than uh, being <coughs> on a marathon, but in a much more harsh environment. And I, I really like that he's smiling. I, and smiling is not so easy because it's really tough. And when you see on the shuttle the survival rate, when you're counting really the accidents which we had, were one to 36. These gentlemen really, and ladies, they really want to do that. They have to learn a lot of things. They don't get really high salary. You're on the space station, and trust me, we're recycling all liquids. So you're on a half year on the space station, and you drink your own pee. Sorry, I have to correct you. It's not only your own pee, you can also drink the pee of your colleagues. We recycle air, and, and the future when we go far space travel would be also that we grow on our food. So it's a good test environment also to do certain things. And of course, it's not about only guys. It's also about ladies, which we have also astronauts or space girls. And the Samantha Christopheretti, she will fly next year. And that was made uh, in November 2000. 14 to 2000 June when she was 15 when she was in space station. And I don't know if we have some Star Trek fans in the in the audience. I am one and sorry, that's not the official ESA uniform yet. So she wears a Star Trek uniform at the cupola looking down to Earth and, and putting the finger to a SpaceX a dragonfly. It's a space truck is from SpaceX providing the space station uh, with few uh, spare parts, water, and whatever they need. And I think this is, uh, which I also want to share, our, our industry also moves, because only the smallest part is human spaceflight. It's the most interesting part. It inspires people. It gives the right audience 
also to our kids for stand um, and uh, this is where you, in, in the round and when they have time they sit together because when a new arrival comes they bring fresh food because otherwise you eat canned food or uh, dry food and that's not really appealing and most of the time the people are complaining so Tim Kopra, our Asia Astra, the friend the winner, uh, Roman Romanenko from Russia and Michael Barron and this I think is also which I like they work peaceful together they solve a problem they stay friends for their entire life why I want to show this, because these are our ambassadors for something that they change. And all of our astronauts, when they come back, and this picture was made by Andre Kuypers, our astronaut from the Netherlands. Earth is small. You see this blue marble and the darkness of sky. You see the shimmering, which makes the atmosphere. And this picture is showing a, a part of Earth, which we have trouble since 3000 years. And you don't see borders. You don't see the problems. You only see how close everything is together. On the one side of the Sinai in the middle, the Middle East, the river of Nile uh, with Egypt and, and the Delta, and, and then um, uh, in Cyprus and then the start of Europe. So this is something which, which all our astronauts come back. And therefore, I think when we're going to COP26, when we're looking to green sensibility, I think we have to see first the big picture, what we can do together. And there's nobody better who can tell us than our astronauts. Nevertheless, space is really business. It's all about assets. It's all about technology. And this is the space technology of the last millennium. Because this was TV, bringing broadcast TV everywhere across the planet in as The problem, I don't know if some of you have kids. I have, I have two boys, both 14 olds. They don't book TV anymore. Then look, Netflix and Twitter and, and Reddit. Uh, so they need internet connection. And that will be a little bit in the future, but I will come to that in a second. And also space transportation is making money out of it. In the past, our business model was buying a rocket, throw it away, buying another rocket, throw it away. Uh, and the DOD and NASA has changed this business model because they only pay for payload. And it's the same way when you go to, to the Maldives on vacation and after that you throw the the aircraft away. That was the business model in space in the last millennium. And that has changed. There's a reason why the shuttle price was 40K bringing up one kilogram in lower Earth orbit. It's now with $3,000. So in space, this has changed. But this change has really pushed the three biggest, three big assets space can bring to our society. And this I want to explain you now. There was never a better time for working with space. And it's the decade of space. And I think when you're looking for the last couple of months and years in the newspaper, space was never be so present. Let's start with the first pillar, which is Earth observation. And Earth observation does not bring only the weather forecast, which is important for our farmers when we go to vacation, when we want to fly, when we're using ships. It shows also how, what climate change is doing to our planet. Without Earth observation, we would not even be aware that we have a climate change. Earth observation is the X-ray or the ultrasound for the patient Earth with the doctor humankind. Therefore, Earth observation brings us a lot of data. What our atmosphere is doing, what our glaciers are doing, what our planet will do. And I think at the moment, there are more people discussing that since ever. Earth observation brings also because it's a camera in just high altitude and you cannot cheat. Even when you have a president in the state in South America who's questioned that, and the head of the International Space Research Center, the previous one said, no, what you're saying is not correct. Deforestation is shooting up again. You cannot cheat from space. So it, <coughs> it's a camera which tells us the truth. The good thing is, all these data become more and more available. A lot of data becomes even free of charge. And it's moving up into the cloud. So today, when you go to Amazon, if you go to, to, to um, Microsoft, Azure, a lot of data is already there. A data picture from satellite has 350 layers. And if you connect that with radar data, which you also do from space, where you can see movement of buildings or bridges in millimeters, when you go that to connect that with your data, with statistics, seismic, and other data, you get a three-dimensional model. And if you move in time, you have a four-dimensional model. And that's just number crunching. That is really program intelligence into the cloud. And there are companies like Up42, and it's not difficult. You don't have to buy a satellite if you need a satellite image. 
Up42 is a spinner from, from Airbus. And you just go there if you want to know how many new houses are in Botswana. You go there, break a, a satellite map, put tiles on that. Um, and then uh, you say reflection of roof once a month, an email. Oh, you're looking into the tanks of the Saudis. 15 minutes, just easy programming. And you don't have to be even a programmer to do that. So therefore, I think the data which we have with satellite Earth observation is really empowering. And there was never so be so many satellite data available. And this is for everything, for farming, fishing, everything. That's really a powerful tool to better manage the supply chain, better manage our planet, but better manage also the business of the people. Navigation. We have an entire generation which never get lost. Uh, our kids. So my kids, they never get lost beside their iPhone runs out of power. You know, I was born at least, they had these fault maps. You know, one is structured, you never got them back again. But navigation is much more than finding the way. It's not only what's used by cars, shipping, airplanes, and so on for landing in, in foggy environment. Navigation is a time signal. The time signal helps us to manage also our electric grid. We would have blackouts if we would not use the time signal. The time signal is also used for the synchronization of our base station. So time signals helps us in our high sophisticated industry 4.0 environment to synchronize our processes. So navigation is more than time signals, uh, more than a point. It's time signals for our bank and transactions, ATM machines, and so on. So think about it when you have a process which is really going for IoT when it's going for industry 4.0, using the capabilities of the time segment for synchronization. And of course, it's for farming. There's a project with Google. So this is what we work with John Deere and others in glass, tracking the single plant and putting the right fertilizer and the right whatever to the single plant and maybe even having automated harvesting. And this will come, managing our agriculture in a better way. That was the third. Earth observation, the second was Navigation, and now to the big, big thing, which is my favorite one, is telecommunication. And this is roughly the coverage what we have with GSM, and yellow is 4G, 3G, 4G. <clears throat> and that's not good when we're talking to the entire planet. I think landmass, we have about 18%, 20% landmass. If we took our entire planet, it's much, much less. And my question is always, in the rest of the areas, is there nobody walking, uh, shipping, flying? And uh, I know there is a project with Scottish Wells where we connect base stations and, and information, but there is no telecommunication network. I have the problem when I drive from Austria to Germany across uh, the border. The, the both telecommunication companies cannot agree on the, on, on the signal. So I'm, I'm lost for, for at least 10 minutes. If we have our high connected environment, this will not work. Therefore, what it plays at the moment, and uh, some of the companies already know, and I'll come to them in a second, is not having our geo-orbit um, satellites and geo-orbit where our telecommunication satellites now, but bring them much closer to Earth. And this will be the future. We will have several, uh, my, my guess, between four and eight really mega constellations, maybe you heard about that. So smaller satellites, which needs less power, you need small antennas, and you connect that to your telecommunication network or IoT network. And uh, this will change the way because we will connect the last billion to the internet. And it will be internet or IoT everywhere. And every, especially the people having predictive maintenance, predictive production, or even sensors which have to have a feedback channel or automotive driving, shipping, and so on. This will all need the connectivity by space because terrestrial will not manage it. And that's the real race between these two gentlemen. It's not about who's going for the tourism. The tourism art is nice, but this is small. Both of them work on a mega constellation. And Starlink is by far the fastest one. When we're looking at led to the mega constellation, we speak about 33 billion investing in at the moment. And better than nothing is the, is the service which uh, Spacelink is offering. But I think it's not only the IoT which brings. And uh, Nicholas Nekoponte, the founder of the MIT Media Lab, and I had once the pleasure to work with him, I said once, internet access is a human right. It will connect the last billion. 
and it will bring connectivity where I do not lay a glass fiber on islands, Africa, Asia, remote area. It will bring connectivity everywhere. And one of my favorites, and this will also be done by startup companies, to, to, to a gentleman I saw in Washington uh, just a couple of weeks ago, uh, Mineric is doing laser communication and Daniel on the left side is building uh, re reusable rockets. They're building at the moment a laser backbone, permanent online life with a lot of satellites with laser beams connected. And that's the future. It will bring connectivity to all the devices which we're looking on where we speak land, when we speak air, when we speak sea, when we read rail and so on. Because without connectivity, we cannot be smart. So now we really have to see where we have our smartness and how we as space bring the asset and the infrastructure where you connect it. And this is, a, I have my office in the Netherlands, and this is the average time of numbers of hours spent in the traffic jam. If you just make our traffic smart, when I start, when I leave, uh, and manage that, I save not only my time, I save really also staying in the queue and I save really spending of CO2 in the environment. It's one of N applications when we are connected, we could be smarter. On the other side, but this was always the criticism I get, okay, when we have the, all these satellites, uh, this is a lot of um, space debris and then uh, maybe stuff which is not working. Good question, always saying, but we also have a company out of Switzerland. Uh, and therefore, I love my SMEs. I love my startups because Luke had less than three or 800,000 euros seed investment and it was going for a 100 million contract with ESA for space debris removal. And he got it. And Airbus is now the subcontractor. We need the smart SMEs, the smart startups. They're really shaping the things. The round head in the square holes, which comes up with new uh, uh, solutions and new space solutions. And this is the reason why the vision is so important. A lot of stuff was already there in Lighted, but we were maybe too blind to see it. We only see it when on the market. And this is the reason why we have to work more with startup. And this is the reason why we also have people like Paul, our ambassador, pushing and helping for that. Reinventing Fire is a book which is pretty old already. And uh, we believe that will be also the future. Because energy will be for free, but we have to store it. You will be pay for storage. So also the hardware stuff. And space was not inventing the uh, solar cells or the fuel cells, but we were pushing it. So now the industry is to taking over it. And I think we're looking for more technologies. And then we even spin it back in base. And it's again the vision and the power of the people driving it. And there was never better time to make money also out of space, in space, and also connected to the green environment. And for all, and please have that later, to understand a little bit when we speak about 1G, 3, 4, 5, 6, because already 6 is in the planning. <coughs> we are now in this 5G, this IoT, uh, which is in the cloud, connecting the cloud. And the next one with the 6G will be even more. It's really the, the bridging the physical and the digital world. And this is also something where the people want. It's not about the box, of course. It's really how we really connect our uh, individuals, each other, and make it better. Looking to space and to the roadmap, this is a little bit what's coming on from our side. And therefore, we, we, I want to share that slide, at least, that you have seen it where we have all the different fields of areas from the transport, agriculture, USB, FinTech, 3D networks, and so on. So, and I think this is where everybody finds something and you cannot allow that your space or terrestrial system is only limited to terrestrial. So the future of 5G will be hybrid networks. We have something on ground, we have a space component and you will switch without that the customer does even know. And there were rumors even with the iPhone that there will be satellite 5G enabled. And this will come, not in this version, but in some of the next version. Because connectivity is a key for our entire industry. So a little bit about our landscape is doing, because on Earth observation, we also work on digital twins. When you want to predict the future, you not only have to invest in it, like Steve Jobs said, but you also have to work on the model. So this is something where we combine what we've done in Earth observation with IT. We have that, or not only for Earth, we're doing that for space, which and, uh, space exploration, which is also interesting. But it's also the economy we're just talking about, the smart homes, the smart city, the uh, farm to four, the mobility, the uh, logistics, and so on. And one thing which is super core, which will only work 
they become smart is that we connect the connectivity global because then your product is globally available and not limited to certain activities. One chart, and maybe this is something which uh, um, um, uh, you should have when you work with ASAP. It looks super complicated, but isn't. We have funding programs based on TLLs, which means you have a technology level early, you have just the idea, we put a lot of funding in. If it goes to close the market, TL9, our funding is less. And based on the technology, Earth observation, telecommunication, launchers, uh, navigation, we have the different programs. But you don't have to remember that. This is something where Paul will help because these are the most important things. Uh, and, um, and Space Solution is our program and business application where we help SMEs to attach space components, know-how, service to your product. We don't expect that you to do build rockets. It's not necessary. We have enough. The power is with the downstream sector. When you look into the launchers, the launcher make only two, three percent of the entire space market. But the 300 billion space market, this is really where the application is, where we attach the logic, our services to your product and make it more digital and broad and across the world. This is a project my team work is adding. We're building the laser communication and the navigation network for the moon because that's the next step. We will go back to the moon. And it's good because the society stops exploring, stops progressing. And it's not about the tourists. Forget the tourists, the market is so small. It's about bringing internet, bringing communication, and that is something that, and this is should, the discussion we should have about. And we connect our future endeavors from the moon back to the earth. And now one of the slides, because I always have my kids in the presentation, uh, Johannes is a little bit older now, and it's the only thing you have to remember when we speak about innovation. When you, and this is Johannes when he was one year old, dismantling my toolbox in my uh, uh, holiday home in Croatia. Stay curious like our kids were. Find your curiosity back, because this is, at least drives me, this is what drives to work with the SMEs and the startups, doing different things, where we can be innovative. Think about when the last time you were innovative and what happened to you. Because this is something we lost maybe in our career, where school was kicking out our curiosity and university tried to bring it back. Because that's in our driver. Because I believe everybody can reach the stars. You just have to add space. Thank you very much. Thank you, Frank. Wow, um, what a great presentation. I think um, it was really interesting to see all the future uh, things we need to think about and also um, Earth observation and, you know, finding out what our planet is doing and how, you know, powerful that data is as well and how we can use it. And it's great to see that, you know, SMEs are part of that, you know, big push to doing all this. So thank you so much. I know you can't stay for the Q&A session. I think there was one question from one of our colleagues, Sunil. Um, are you OK just to quickly answer that before? Sure, you sure, sure, sure. I think, uh, and um, I'm sorry that I, I cannot stay. Yeah. But I, it's in the good hands of my colleague, Paul. Paul uh, yeah, of course, it's yeah. so long, he, he has so much knowledge in his brain. So I'm, I'm always asking him also sometimes what's going on in his area. But please go ahead. What was the um, question? Sunil, do you want to just quickly ask your question that you had? Yes, uh, thank you for that, uh, Denise. Uh, no, all it was was that, you know, uh, it's new to local authorities to explore uh, the, the space. Uh, we, we always concentrated on building highways uh, on, on ground uh, with the help of uh, but what the question is that, you know, can the uh, space be explored with the European Space Agency and start building highways in sky? Uh, because that's where the drones are going to be flying because we've obviously got the commercial flights taking off, but how do we deal with and how can we use the technology that you've developed yeah. to build Sorry, up that infrastructure? It's an exa excellent question. And you use the technology already today because when, when you go to the city council, where are your pipes, where your sewage system, you have geo points. Yeah, every, every light is a landmark. Yeah, so you have geo points. You're using already Garmin and, and name them all when you build a new street and a new house. So these are geo points. For example, what you can do, and we have companies even checking these geo points where you say, okay, uh, uh, we have we have uh, areas where they use radar data. You see if a bridge or something is moving. 
So when you're, especially in, in areas where you have mining, that's super important, you know, what plays with the, with the ground. Uh, we're working with the city of Prague. They have a problem. They had sewage systems from the, uh, from the monarchy of, of the Austrians. So they had, don't have a plan. So we have a company in Belgium, I think we support it. They make special rovers through the, through the uh, pipes to build a plan where our pipes, because in the past years, they just dicked, you know, hide and seek. So this is, this is just about information. Space gives you an infrastructure. Just a follow-up question onto that, Frank, then. Then can we use that uh, technology again to assist us with the developing technology on autonomous and connected vehicles? Because at the moment we're exploring a lot of uh, infrastructure to try and get that connectivity. But if you're saying that's already there, do we now need to start making sure that we're at least addressing that rather than putting infrastructure into which is I think this is something where Paul can help because the best is always to ask what is what what is your problem and there's a nice saying unefficient artist imitate experience artist copy you know uh, this is uh, uh, definitely say see what other people have done what we can acquire what we copy what we have to do ourselves because you have a certain uh, there's also one of my my favorite uh, uh, portal is the open uh, data portal of New York you know they make all their their data in the same format and they tell you even on friday afternoon where are the most tickets so i think that's the power you have to combine your data with with our data and bring it in the right format in the right tool uh, and and then uh, you, then you can react because then you're not just reacting you can plan and this is something all other city i think all the cities in the world Planning is the key. Who's planning? Uh, who, who's, who's planning is the Lord of the day, Goethe once said. And then uh, Paul has a very good overview of what we're already doing, but we're always keen to find, and this is where ESA helps, and putting even money on top, uh, funded by the British government, developing new solutions yeah, uh, to solve problems, especially in the cities. Uh, and, uh, and then it's a win-win-win deal. Paul, said that, that correct then? Yeah, thanks, Frank. So I think, Sonia, we can pick that up at Q&A or later as well. But I've got an example of a project, at least one project, probably two projects that, that will show you that we're doing lots of stuff in, in CAV so. already. CAV it depends on, on the stuff that, um, that, that Frank was talking about, you know, navigation, ubiquitous comms, all this stuff about the new uh, mega constellations as well. So, so yeah, so <laughs> we, can, we can pick that up. No, I appreciate and it. Thank you. Local problem. It's cool to solve pop space problem, like uh, I have to mention, because moonlight, that's pretty cool. Huh? But by the end of the day, your problem is first. Uh, if we have the technology, and when, when you become happy, it's okay. Uh, my, uh, <coughs> there's even a company I remember in Germany uh, which make a, a, So you put the camera on the broken glass or the broken light, and it goes direct to the city council with the geo point, and they know what to repair. There's much better, yeah, and, and they get a, I don't know, a gratification when you've done 10 things, then the people of the city just driving around and search for the, the mistakes. So this is about how you involve all the people. So sometimes I say the business model has just to be different. Yeah? And, and the, the people take care of their city. Everybody does. We, this we have to empower. Appreciate cool. that. Uh, thank you. Yeah, I thank think you. we got uh, we, we give us really something hard to bite. You know, this uh, we love. Huh? Okay, thank you so much, thank, Frank. Thanks for joining thank us you. today. It's been really in, enlightening to see all what's going on. So, thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> okay, um, so now we'll hand over to Paul. Your name's been mentioned quite a lot, Paul. So, Paul's the uh, general manager of uh, Grace at the University of Nottingham. And, and he'll be sharing an insight into how um, they assist businesses and startups and individuals to take advantage of satellite navigation. So over to you, Paul. OK, so thanks, Denise. Can you see my screen, first of all? Just uh, tell yes. me that. Okay. Yeah. Brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> OK, so thanks, Frank, for that um, that fantastic overview, introduction and very visionary, um, you know, fly through of, of what space means and what it can do. I'm going to bring that a little bit more down to earth and hopefully talk to you practically about how you can use uh, the funding potentially that's available from ESA to help you build your business using space data and also to support um, sustainable growth and um, sustainability with your own, within your own business as well. So as you heard from Denise and from Frank, I'm one of four current regional ambassadors across the UK representing 
um, business applications and ESA space solutions. And I particularly work on the aspect of business applications, which I'm going to tell you more about. I look after the Midlands and Northeast region and I'm hosted by the University of Nottingham. So first of all, this is a little bit about me. So I, I'm normally based in that building there on the right hand side because of um, lockdown. I've been there probably about three or four times in the last year, like some of us have. And um, that in itself is a building which is a, a test bed uh, for satellite applications technology. It's in the University of Nottingham. It's on the Jubilee campus at the University of Nottingham. And it has test facilities and test beds in it for developing um, satellite applications, based services, um, businesses and technologies. That's what I do. I've got about 16 years of experience working within the geospatial and um, space sector myself. Known Frank for most of that time. And 13 of those years have been looking after the geospatial GNSS Research Application Centre of Excellence. GNSS is basically an acronym, one of the satellite systems that's out there and basically delivers satellite navigation signals like GPS as we know it. But I'm not going to be talking about that today. Um, so that's just a little bit about me. I've been involved in various spin-offs from the University of Nottingham and still am as well. And that's the, the region that I cover there on the right hand side. Right, so to, to kind of encapsulate what uh, what Frank was saying and to bring that a little bit more just in some standard kind of corporate bullet points, these bullet points are actually something that um, that NASA uh, put forward to explain the importance of space in a, in a macro level. What, what does it do? Well, it allows large areas of the Earth to be viewed at once. The Earth observation that, um, that Frank was talking about and the fact that, that satellite data doesn't lie, it allows us to collect more data more quickly and more often. So for example, some of the satellite missions that Frank was alluding to, the Sentinels, the Copernicus, Earth Observation, Eyes on Earth mission that ESA um, launched and, and operated, provides information on a on a three-day or four-day basis. And some of the satellites that, that, um, that Frank was alluding to, these mega constellations, they're providing updates every few hours and giving us very high resolution pictures um, of the Earth, we can use these sensors to actually zoom in and look at more data. And we don't, we're not just looking at optical data, we're looking at infrared data, ultraviolet data, hyperspectral data, as we call it, all across, across the, the, um, the opticals and visible and radio spectrum. So we can start to observe lots of different things that are happening. We can actually look at data and collect it on places that are really hard for us to get to. Again, that Frank was talking about that um, that image of the Earth where he looked about, looked, showed the disconnection between communications. And we can look into um, to space as well without obscuration. So we can find out more about what's happening. For example, those fantastic pictures that we see from Hubble. Frank also talked about navigation, allowing us to position and get precise timing wherever we are on the Earth as well. And a business of space. So, um, you know, Frank touched on this uh, again. So as the European Space Agency, we're involved in the upstream. We build the satellites, we the satellites host the payloads. We have the sensors, the rockets that launch those and launch sites that we need in order to launch those rockets and have those payloads in space. The ground stations that monitor the satellites. We call that the upstream, the things that are going up into space. And as Frank mentioned, that's just for a portion of the space industry. The downstream is what we're really interested in. That's about why have we got all those satellites in space, all the data that it's producing, including the images that Frank talked about, the location that we get from satellite navigation, such as GPS, which has really, really transformed us in terms of the way that we take Google Maps, for example, um, for granted on our phones nowadays, that we can share our live location, something that we only saw in movies like Harry Potter in the past as well, um, the satcoms that he talks about, and space enabled services and applications. So we talk about that in terms of the data coming down from space. And the astonishing thing is, if you look at the UK space strategy, actually data from space underpins about 14% of our national GDP in the UK. And a study was done a few years ago by the UK government on if we switched off satellite navigation, the source of um, location and timing in the UK, the UK economy, it would cost the UK economy a billion pounds per day over a five day period until we could put the mitigating 
um, actions and processes in place to be able to um, to overcome that. So you're starting to get a flavour of how important space technology is, the kind of level of data we get and how important it is for sustainability as well, being able to do all this remote sensing and being able to, to, to know where things are and understand what's going on um, with the environment. So I'm here. I'm here to promote um, European Space Agency business applications. We have a fantastic website, business.esa.in. You'll go there, you'll go find all the detail about this. Those are the menu items at the top of that screen there that will um, that will you can use to navigate that site. And we our strap line is your business powered by space. So this is what we want to do. We're not there solely for space companies. You saw from Frank the different funding lines that we have. In fact, when we talk about business applications, we really, really want to go out to those companies that don't even realize that they're using space, don't really know what, what space is all about. It's something, you know, Frank touched on it again, that, you know, why we, as, as um, Prince Andrew said about, <laughs> about William Shatner shooting off in, in Jeff Bezos's rocket, you know, we should be concentrating on the problems down here on Earth. Well, as Frank said, actually the importance of space it allows us to understand and see and monitor what's um, what's happening down on Earth as well. And that's why we're, it's um, it's really important. And if you followed it, one of the things that Bill Shatner said was, well, you know, one of the things we're doing is we're bringing the cost of access down to space so that we can actually get these polluting technologies, these polluting industries into space and we can actually start to, to make that all, that better for life on Earth as well. So it's very important. And we've invested, it's a massive investment program, business applications. We've invested over 250 million euros in businesses and over 1200 businesses that focuses squarely on SMEs. So those are the businesses we're looking for. There's three elements to ESA space solutions, business applications that I'm going to talk about, uh, business incubation that I'm going to touch on, and tech transfer. And um, these are the elements. So we're part of a massive network. We've got a huge network in the UK, but a network all over, the Euro over Europe as well and beyond. So actually we can connect you to other parts of the UK. We can connect you to other parts of Europe as well. Um, that network consists of the technology broker network that um, that look at space technology and how we can transfer that onto um, industries and businesses on the earth. The business incubation centers which support startups that are less than five years old. There's a number of locations for those business incubation centers in the UK. The main one is a place called Harwell which is more or less a centre of space business in the UK, space technologies. That's a, a campus which is just outside um, Oxford and is home of the satellite applications Catapult. And um, they, they provide grants, business incubation centres provide grants of um, about €50,000 to start up businesses less than five years old. They also have locations in Daresbury, um, in the northwest, in Edinburgh, and now in Leicester as well. So I work very closely, for example, with the ESA Business Incubation Centre in um, in Leicester. And business applications where we are providing zero equity funding. So we provide funding from sixty thousand euros up to millions of euros. And I'll give you some ideas of just a fraction of some of the projects that we've supported here in the UK. And you get the support of me to help you access that program and to apply for that funding as well. So I'm very, very looking forward to talking to, to you on an individual basis um, if you're more interested in this programme to see how it can help you um, grow and scale your business. So I did mention that I work very closely with the ESA Business Incubation Centre, which is based um, in Leicester. I do work closely with all of the ESA Business Incubation Centres, but this is on a new site called the Space Park at Leicester. I don't know if some of you have seen it or heard about it. It's a new facility in Leicester where they are, um, it's an opportunity to, um, to interface with the industry. And there's a lot of facilities there in terms of access to data like um, Amazon or web services and all sorts of things and space data and to, um, to link up with other companies, base your business as well. So there's subsidised desk facilities if you apply for the ESA bit and you get an, a grant of £43,000, I said, and loads and loads and loads of support. So I can guide you on that if you've got a startup and you're interested in the ESA bit. So I'm going to talk about ESA business applications, which is a scheme that I'm here primarily to promote. So what are we looking for? Well, we work in space, as you saw 
from what Frank said, but we like to say that the biggest part or the biggest part of the industry is the applications sector. And we're looking for people, for companies that have identified a market opportunity that's got real potential for making a difference here on earth and scaling and making money. And we want to hear about business ideas that are commercially viable, possible, but incorporate some form of space data. And as I said, we're looking really for non-space companies. So if you're using GPS data or you want to use GPS data or you plan to use that or you've got plan to use SATCOM's data 5G. So 5G, 6G is going to be transmitted by these mega constellations um, that um, Frank mentioned. So Starlink, OneWeb, all of these satellite systems that we hear about in the news all the time. What do we offer? We offer zero equity funding. So it comes in the form of a um, fixed firm price contract from ESA as a grant. And um, the price you've agreed is the price that you'll get from ESA. You get an upfront payment as that as well. You get a personalized technical officer from ESA who will help you through the whole process, technical commercial guidance, access to our partners, as I said, and obviously the credibility of ESA brand. So I'm part of a network of four ambassadors at the moment covering the whole country. We all have our own technical competences as well. And if you're interested in collaborating or doing something in another region, then um, then let me know and I can connect you on that as well. I often do events and joint activities with my colleagues as well, such as Ken and Alan and Andy. So you, you're probably aware um, space is growing across the whole of the UK with launch sites coming in in Scotland and in Cornwall as well. So there's a, there's a lot of activity going on. So what are we looking for? So we are not an R&D program. We don't support R&D. We support businesses that are bringing services to the market. And more importantly, we support businesses that are integrating some form of space data into their businesses. So innovative services, that what we're looking for is a market demand. So we're not after those professors who've got an idea and just want to kind of see if, if they can push that idea out onto the market. No, we're looking for something where you can integrate that data and the client needs a service and that service will benefit from that space data, whether that's GPS, whether it's comms, whether that's earth observation, what we said, that remote sensor thing. So we're focused on the business and service deployment and what we pay you for is to develop that service and to integrate the space data into that service so we avoid R&D we want you to be working closely in partnership with the users and the customers that's essential for this if you don't have them on board then this is not the right program for you and we want to develop integrated sustainable services sustainable there means that they uh, they're going to grow they're going to create um, generate some um, some revenue generate some returns um, economic returns for for the country and for your company but also we are interested in sustainable sustainable businesses that are supporting sustainability as well and we have a whole load of funding schemes so we start right from the basic level at kickstart projects which are actually pre-feasibility so there's an idea that you want to develop with the client and develop the use cases for that that's a lower level of funding i'll come into that we have feasibility studies which is a higher level of funding where you your result will be the feasibility of what we call a service definition. So you can develop that service in a consultation with your clients. Your clients are interested in that and um, you're going to you're going to do the first prototype of that service that can then be developed into a business. And then demonstration projects where we give most of our money. That's where you're working with the client to do a pilot of your service that integrates the satellite data. We have a number of ways you can work with us. So in terms of the business ambassadors, the thing we're promoting the most is what we call direct negotiations. So any idea, any time, pick up the phone, come and talk to me and we can work on that. Um, we, we can work on the idea for that service. We also have competitive tenders where you can, on a topic that's um, defined by ESA, you can um, you can bid into that competitively to um, to get funding and then something called Aspire with ESA, which is more around um, sustainable development goals as well, which is the easier way to get into ESA. So there's a number of ways that you can engage with us. What can you do as part of this program or well, anything as long as you're not dealing with a military application or a military sale 
we will look at anything. So any application, whether to do with um, sustainability, maritime healthcare, transport, um, sustainable services, environment, education, aviation, financial. Frank talked about timing from GPS satellites and Galileo satellites, collectively what we call GNSS, Global Navigation Satellite Systems. One of the most important or the most fundamental and important aspect of those satellites is the timing signal. It's the most precise time you can get. Everything depends on time from um, GNSS satellites, and that is crucial for um, for financial transactions as well, and um, for for all sorts of things that we really take for granted. So we can finance probably more than three million euros. In our direct negotiations, what we will provide is 50% of the cost of a project. So if your project costs you 3 million euros over two years to build a, a highway in the sky or whatever, or probably going to be more than that, you can get half of that funding from us if you wanted to build a prototype vehicle, um, for example. And like I said, this is really important. It's for non-R&D service-oriented businesses. So these are the funding rates. So this kickstarts fixed at 80,000 euros. They're competitively tendered. They'll come up on the topic such as um, uh, sustainability or something like that or environmental protection. And you'll get 75% co-funding from ESA for that. And you'll get all that money up front and as a fixed, fire, fixed firm price contract. And the rest of the funding can be coming from you as in kind. So it can be your time, for example on the project. Those projects are fixed at a duration of six months. Then we have the feasibility studies, which for the the, um, the competitive tenders are generally around 250,000 euros, and they can be funded at 100% for the competitive tenders. Um, but for the open call for feasibility studies, we don't do kickstarts in the open call, but feasibility studies projects can be up to 500,000 euros, and you'll get 50% of your costs covered. And those projects are fixed at nine months duration. Demonstration projects are bigger ones and um, you'll get 50% of your cost covered, whether it's for a competitive tender or for a direct negotiation. So as I said, invitations to tender on thematic areas decided by ESA and um, direct negotiations always open. Okay, so there is a catch. Unfortunately, the UK do not support kickstarts at this present time. It doesn't mean that they won't support them in the future, but they don't at this present time and for feasibility studies the UK is elected to only fund feasibility studies whether they're at competitive tenders or direct negotiations at 50 percent that's because of two principal reasons one we want to fund more projects and two we want you to see that you are close to the market so you're prepared to um, uh, co-finance these projects so it's not R&D grant funding it's all about services so it's investment so these are some of the upcoming funding calls and open calls that are open at the moment, either as thematics or as um, tendered calls. And um, these are the ones that the UK is subscribing to in particular. So you'll find much more if you go to the ESA website, but these are the ones that the UK is funding. So you'll see that in case of sustainability, resilient utilities, all about monitoring our, um, for example, underground pipes, uh, electricity networks, um, and building, building resilience into those, as, as Frank touched on as well. Space for aviation. Here we're looking at safety in particular. So that feeds into what Sunil was talking about, the highways in the skies. But in that case, you know, you should come talk to me and we can talk about um, how we can support through the open call. Space for tourism as well. NHS Future Hospital. So working in partnership with Hans Hampshire trust but around how do we build future hospitals to be more sustainable space for rail which is a thematic call which is all about incorporating data from satellites to make our our, um, our railways more efficient more green and um, more resilient and um, space for safety and security applications the process is you um, you come talk to me and at least five days before you submit the application you let the UK Space Agency and the European Space Agency know that you're going to submit. But, you know, hopefully you're interested. And if you're interested, then I'll give you much more information about the process and what you can get funded. So we're talking about sustainability. So what I've got now is a few examples of some projects that hopefully you'll find interesting. 
These projects are examples of projects that have been funded by the European Space Agency, were approved by the UK Space Agency. So the UK Space Agency is what we call the national delegate. So they will approve the funding for your project. So you're talking to the UK Space Agency and the European Space Agency at the same time. This is a company called Resitec, which is based in, um, in Harwell, the space cluster in the UK. And what they're doing here is they're using all all types of space data when we talk about Earth observation, GNSS, uh, satellite navigation and satellite com communications to actually gather information and dynamically update the data to monitor uh, lots of different types of land based assets. And that was for the water forestry conversation, com conservation, sorry, and agri business. So agri tech is a huge user of satellite data as well. The pilots they're doing with um, two uh, water utility companies looking at um, repeatable water quality assessments and providing information that's updated on a weekly or daily basis to provide um, intelligence that those water companies can then act on. So, for example, you know, it could be that there's um, there's uh, pollution in the um, in the reservoirs, or it could be there's uh, there's problem precursors for for flooding and things like that. So all sorts of things they're looking at. They've built a um, uh, a, um, a front end, if you like, a, uh, a platform that um, the councils can look at, local authorities and water authorities and stakeholders can look at to, um, to monitor what's going on and measure it. Here we have one which was using um, satellite navigation data and earth observation to understand what's going on with, um, with railway tracks. Uh, can you believe that? With satellite-based radar, we can actually look at deflections on the Earth that are a few millimetres. So our spatial resolution might not be great. We might be looking at five metres or 10 metre size pixels, but we can actually measure land motion, the way the land is moving up and down or assets on the Earth like railway tracks or buildings or bridges at very, very fine um, resolution. So this was all about looking at railway assets and using remote sensing data, as we call it, to manage um, rail track conditions and then prioritise um, workloads on track works. Another project which was doing the same thing, and what I should mention is you only need to be using one type of satellite data. Also, it could be Earth observation, it could be um, satellite navigation, it could be the SATCOMs, that, um, that Frank was uh, talking about. The, these two projects I'm talking about are using more than one. So in this one, GNSS and Earth Observation for Structural Health uh, Management, they actually went from a feasibility study to a demonstration phase project. And um, hopefully we haven't got any bridges in the UK that are as bad as that, but that's the Tacoma Bridge in the USA, which actually collapsed. And um, the, the point here is that bridges are very, very important for our economies, for travel, for transport. And we need to have a way for monitoring what's happening to those bridges as they vibrate with large load loads on lots of cars, lots of lorries and, um, and, and weather conditions. So we're using satellite navigation to measure very precise deflections on the bridge and combining that with other sensors. And again, there's a dashboard that provides real time metrics on what's happening on this. And this system was actually used, if you remember a couple of years ago, the intense winds on the Forth Road Bridge um, in, um, in Scotland over the 5th of 4th. It was actually used to measure what was happening and uh, was used as a basis for closing that bridge for a number of days, carrying out repairs and rerouting traffic. So this now, this product is actually being used on a number of bridges around the world, particularly in China, where they've got lots of long span bridges. Another interesting project here is Smart Grids, which was only a feasibility stage, um, is looking at demonstration phase now, but looking at electricity networks to understand and monitor what was going on there to be able to manage um, those systems better. Very interesting one, which has just um, completed its feasibility stage and is a start as a spin off company from the University of Leeds um, using again, I mentioned satellite radar technology from satellites which are 700 kilometers away, but looking at the surface of the Earth and looking at very, very fine um, changes in height on infrastructure is looking at risk modeling for leaking pipes. 
the water authority is a huge problem obviously so that's the kind of things that we can do with the satellite technology uh, one which is kind of closer to transport here and um, Frank kind of alluded to this as well which is about energy management on the grid so something we call vehicle to ground so now when we talk about connected cars we talk about v2x vehicle to anything vehicle to x vehicle to vehicle vehicle to infrastructure v2i this is about v2g so managing energy consumption in vehicles and um, with building so making sure that we have the we don't waste any of the of that energy and it's uh, very well uh, distributed and managed for stationary cars and buildings that are kind of you know managing their um, their lighting and their heating and all those kind of things and that's um, being delivered through a spin-off from AT Kearney called EVA switch um, and the University of Nottingham was involved in that okay so there was one other project that I want to mention that I didn't put in there called CoDrive and CoDrive is another example of a um, of a uh, ESA business applications project that went from Kickstarter to feasibility to demonstration actually went straight from Kickstarter to demonstration so a lot of Kickstarter projects go straight to the larger demonstration phase projects and um, and in that project it is focused on connected auto autonomous vehicles so building um, satellite navigation receivers that are used to position vehicles but also control them so why is satellite navigation really important for um, connected vehicles you know most of the cars we have nowadays have these advanced features where they're doing lane keeping they can see the cars in front they've got adaptive cruise control what satellite navigation from satellites and navigation signals and positioning signals from satellites give us is what we call absolute position so we don't see things just that around us that we see with the cameras we actually know our xyz components wherever we are so that's important for for cars that are going to be flying as well as cars that are on the ground as well so hopefully that gives you a flavor of what funding is available the scale of it and i'm here my colleagues are here to really promote this program but also to help you in the process of applying for it and getting a contract as well. So, um, so that's uh, that's where I wanted to say, Denise. So back to you. Thank you, Paul. That's um, really interesting to see all the millions of euros that have been invested in, um, you know, all those businesses. And you know, it's great to see all the funding opportunities available for startups and SMEs as well. And I should have said um, earlier, the slides will be uh, shared so um, everyone will have Paul's details and be able to refer back to the slides. And obviously, please do share it with other SMEs that, you know, have got an innovative uh, um, solution that might need um, investment in. So wonderful. Thank you, Paul. Um, now um, I'd like to hand over to our uh, speaker, Leslie Holt from West Midlands 5G, who's going to be outlining how 5G can make a real difference to your business. So, Leslie, and we can see your slides already. So thank you. <laughs> Excellent. And you can hear me? Yes, can hear you. Thank you. OK, yeah. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. And gosh, you're all going to come down to earth now because uh, I'm not uh, uh, as uh, as clever and as interesting as um, um, Frank and Paul. But hopefully what I have got to say um, outlines um, a little bit of what we've done and um, how we've worked with SMEs and startups and and some opportunities that, uh, uh, that, that perhaps I can share with you and, and get you thinking about, particularly 5G. So um, I'm Leslie Holt. I I uh, work for West Midlands 5G and I'm the accelerator and I'll explain what I mean by that uh, and communications director. So let me first of all um, tell you a little bit about who we are and I'll be super quick um, and what our objectives are. Um, now if I reflect back and it was interesting some of the slides and I can't remember if it was Frank's now where they talked about you know 2G, 3G, 4G etc. And if you go back to, you know, 4G that we're that the current phase, or say current, we're 5G now, but the the phase before um, when smartphones came out, they really, really changed our lives, particularly consumers. Um, so 5G has has come along, and why? why do we want to be at the you know why is it important and why is it important for the uk um, so uk government took um, a view um, in back in 2018 that it was important to be at the front at the forefront of 5g technology um, now when they launch 4g and i'll get my facts and figures slightly wrong but just to kind of show the point um, is the UK were about the 150th country to roll out 4G 
With 5G, we were in the top five. So we've made a difference. We are you know, at the forefront. Um, but I guess the question is why? Does that matter what place you are at? Um, but if you think about 4G, if you actually start looking at the application layer, it's the, app, it's the apps that actually made the difference. The Ubers, the Facebooks, you know, we all use internet banking, et cetera, et cetera. So actually what the innovations and the opportunities lie in what you know what can be on top of that network layer so UK government decided that um, they wanted to be play a part in making sure that we were ahead of that innovation not just the technology um, and actually before we came along had some individual projects looking at uh, looking at what 5G could do but they made um, a determination at the end of 2018 that they wanted to actually have a larger urban area looking at not just a project but a program of actually activity um, and West Midlands um, was super keen to be at the forefront applied and was successful for the funding so we are now in our third year of delivery so what 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 are our two kind of key objectives one is um, accelerate the rollout of 5G because actually without 5G then we can't be actually doing the testing and the innovation and we are not responsible uh, we're not a mobile network operator but what could we do to work with local authorities um, own a, a lot of assets that are suitable for 5G um, infrastructure how can we work with mobile network operators to make sure that actually when they're thinking of um, an area or a geography they come to us first uh, and we've been really successful the, U the West Midlands is is the um, most connected 5G region in the UK. Now we've got a long way to go, but we're making we're making great strides. Um, I think the more exciting part is actually the second of our objectives, which is testing, proving, and scaling new 5G services. And again, we looked at the region and we looked at the strengths of the region um, in transport, in health and manufacturing. And they're the kind of three key sectors that we're currently looking at. But we also um, wanted to open up opportunities for SMEs and startups to understand the possibilities that 5G could deliver. So we set up um, 5G accelerators in the region. I'm going to move to um, this, this is where this is the slide where I'm going to fail uh, abysmally when I look at what Paul and, and the detail that Paul and Frank um, discussed. But just an analogy before I go on this slide, we were um, talking actually to one of our manufacturers only a couple of weeks ago, um, uh, you know, with my colleagues talking about 5G technology. And he then gave this little story, which I'll really shortcut. But there was a film, a film that Mel Smith was in many, many years ago, um, and he landed somewhere and, and, and from, on a spaceship in, you know, somewhere on Earth. And, you know, everybody was interrogating him about the technology. And his answer was, I'm just the driver. Um, now, that is important because actually a lot of the sectors that we're dealing with are specialists in their business area, know their business inside and out. They don't know the technology nor necessarily do they need to they just want to know what it enables and what it what it's capable of um so i'm, I'm glad they're super super clever people that know know their stuff but i think what i just want to draw out is you know i'm going to be in a minute showcasing some of the um opportunities that we've worked on so what are the features that 5g offers that that has helped um, you know some of the trials and examples i'm going to show you um so Again, we've 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 seen already massive device connectivity. Um, everything's going to, you know, we've got sensors in everything near enough now. Not all are connected, but you know, sensors not just in thinking of cars, but in buildings, on ourselves, etc. And actually, 5G allows for it says here one million um, devices per square kilometres. In layperson's terms, that's probably about 17 times more um, than 4G. So as we you're going to use more sensors, as we're going to have that connectivity, we need to be able to you know like be able to connect um ultra low latency um one millisecond delay what that really means again from a layperson is pretty much no delay so you know clearly autonomous vehicles come to mind but actually anything that's time critical um so that can apply you know in healthcare in, in other sectors as well um super high speeds now it depends on on, on the scenario but anything from 10 to 100 times faster have been have been tested so that means that a lot more data um, in real time can come through and then that's really the opportunity to use that data um, wisely to inform etc so i think from a from a high level capabilities 
this in terms of the green agenda, in my opinion, is that the kind of real time information and that data exchange that can inform um, how we go about our business, whether that's looking at it from, you know, preventative, um, predicting um, scenarios in, in different sectors. But let me tell you what we have done. Uh, and what we are continuing to do. And I'm going to hone in firstly on the three area work stream areas that we've been looking at and how 5G can transform and has transformed um, patient care. Um, so way back, way back in our first year, we undertook the first uh, remote ultrasound scan, um, allowing um, a paramedic to connect with a, an experienced expert clinician um, from out in the field. Now, this is important because paramedics are superly qualified, but at the same time, they don't always have um, access to you know, experts that are needed, A, for critical care, but B, actually making sure that a patient is transferred um, or is not transferred if they don't need to, or actually transferred to the right hospital, minutes and time that actually can save patients' lives. So it's actually having that expert at, at point of uh, point of um, need, um, whether that in this instance as a paramedic, you'll see my next instance I'm going to talk about is actually in care homes. Um, so we also um, last year trialled and actually rolling out. So it's not, it's a trial, a, a lot of the work we do are, um, a lot of the work, examples we do are in real world examples that real world sounds awful, doesn't it? But they're actually examples that are happening and then we can roll roll them out. So the um, fully remote ward rounds um, started last year. I mean, it, it wasn't planned for COVID, but super timely um, that it is, you know, we're all used to now perhaps getting a GP on the end of a line. It's not that it's actually being able to have a full diagnostics using you know from an ECG to you know heart monitors to to all the different array of equipment that you would get if you actually sat in front of a GP in a practice it's been able to do that remotely using 5G in a care home and then we looked at it from a lot of practicalities in terms of GPs doing ward rounds to care homes can be timely going from one care home to another um, wasted time on the road, a lot of it useful in a, in a kind of rural setting, but also, you know, looking at it from a green agenda, you, you know, a lot of waste going from A to B, actually being able to connect to a GP, um, like I say in real time, um, makes the GP much more accessible um, for patients in a care home. And, you know, it was interesting to see um, some of the examples from the patients that, you know, we're probably dealing with an older demographic that absolutely you know, want to have a GP and have relished the fact that they can get a GP so much more, you know, easily and quicker. So we've got to look at the, um, the, the kind of the human dimension as well as the technical dimension. You know, that care, that project um, initially was five. It's, we've got a scheme to roll out to thirty, but we're actually currently have five, have eighteen care homes that are live. Um, and then the third area um, that we're actually in the process now of, um, uh, we had a. A demo event about a month ago is early bowel cancer diagnostics using 5G camera in a pill, which you can see um, in the picture there is just a little tad bigger than a paracetamol, uh, which is a swallower book, can't say the word, swallowable pill um, that has a lot. Um, it does a norm, what a normal endoscopy would do, but actually gives far more um, better imagery um, and better um, diagnostics actually because you'll have a far more detail and I hate to say it but probably way better than a clinician's eye and also as we as we start trialing it we'll be looking at um, you know in artificial intelligence and in and, 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 and training so that we understand um, and can pick up things that humans perhaps wouldn't so actually what will happen is you're getting a far better easier diagnostics but the kind of reason behind it was not just the technology elements but it was actually linking to kind of the four pillars um, in terms of a health ecosystem of actually can we you know treat the patient at home in the community not bring them to a hospital setting which is actually quite frankly dangerous in in the, in the context of you know op opening up to, to to germs and and you know and now layering it with the covid lens um and this this is a trial that's actually in in happening as we speak so m you know more on that but you know exciting that we've got through three kind of activities that are, that are um happening um transport is a bit dif more difficult for me because to be honest we've probably got 
over 20 different trials and, and more than that in terms of use cases that we've done in this sector, which is great news. Um, the, the biggest by far will be um, the first 5G road sensor network that is in the process being rolled out. I've forgotten the numbers now, but you know we've already got some sensors on a lot of the uh, key route networks in our region. It will ultimately be over 300 um, um, sensors out there, but we're, we're, we're in, we've started delivery um, of that program. Now that again, it says, as it says here, can re reduce road emissions by 2.5%. Yes, it can, but it also can manage traffic. It can do. It can manage um, live traffic congestion. Um, clearly, it contributes to pollution, but it can also start to look at patterns. And again, back to that predictive um, traffic management um, and lots of lots of different um, other scenarios. There, we've looked at um, the 5G connected tram. Um, that was quite interesting in the context that our original brief was looking at it back to that preventative, um, you know, can we look at the you know, maintenance of a tram and actually predict when the potential be problems so that actually we're reducing time out of service. Um, but actually it pivoted quite well to be able to then also monitor passengers, um, passenger um, volumes um, and activity, uh, etc. Um, and again, Another one I'll, I'll just highlight, and, and if we're looking at um, parking, uh, I know transport was mentioned previously, apparently six to eight minutes in an urban area are wasted in terms of time looking for a parking space, uh, which contributes again to you know more emissions, um, more congestion, etc. So we undertook a trial um, using, a five, using uh, 5G to be able to predict um, to be able to ascertain um, parking, um, which again is useful, um, but it can be useful for logistics as well as just looking for a parking space. So like I say, we've got 20 projects in rail, road and passenger experience. Some have come to an end and some are actually still um, happening, um, uh, which will continue until the end of March next year. And then manufacturing, um, I, talking about 5G transforming productivity, we're working with an SME in the region, um, aer um, aerospace, um, looking at three particular areas, uh, machine serviceization, so that's getting you know, effective use of their machines, less downtime, understanding when they've got availability, um, calibration, tool finding and quality assurance particularly that one using a 5G camera to detect faults. Um, we're talking about advanced manufacturing here, um, faults that cannot be seen with the human eye, that is is um, used for quality assuring products, but also used for quality assuring products um, as they go out into the supply chain and come back. Um, so it's tracking and, and checking on the quality. So 5G technology can make a real difference um, in terms of, you know, productivity in manufacturing and again there's a statistic looking at you know again productivity from a waste perspective the UK is 20% behind our European neighbours in terms of um, productivity that is actually we're working right till Friday night whereas our Euro European counterparts are going home on a Thursday I think that you know we, we need to to look at how we can we can make a difference and again we're working very closely with, with a lot of SMEs and, and want to do so um, going forward in, in terms of how we can help them. Um, and then that's the three kind of sectors we're looking at. And I did say at the beginning, we're, we were also um, keen to ensure that SMEs and startups understand how 5G could potentially help them. So we've set up uh, three um, accelerators, Branded Spring. They are situated in uh, Wolverhampton, Birmingham and Coventry, and they have, um, you know, 5G testbed facilities with, you know, before commercial rollout um, technologies that are available to test um, products and services. But I think also, if I, I think we talked about TRL levels there, we deal with, um, you know, a spectrum of organisations that just actually want to understand can 5G or we're looking at a wider remit of can you know other future wireless technologies help with my particular challenge um, and, and just having that really high level of understanding to other organizations that actually have got products and services that they you know want to test want want to see um, if they're feasible and commercially viable so you know a different you know a range of spectrum of organizations that we work with uh, we work with partners and uh, we work with um, o2 deloitte um, digital catapult and wayra um, that deliver um, a lot of uh, some of our programs for us and interestingly 
doing our very our very first programme here was on green innovation at the beginning of this year. Um, and, and that's just one example of a, a smart lamppost powered by uh, 5G, by wind and solar and using 5G technology. Um, construction um, examples and smart cities, uh, green, the green and the construction are complete and the smart cities is actually nearing completion. Uh, and I think, again, what does it do? We 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 are not just talking about SMEs coming along, we marry them up with demand side. So let me just give you an example in terms of smart cities is, you know, we, we could come along and look at lots of different technologies. But what we've done is we've engaged with, in this instance, all seven local authorities, including Coventry City Council, on what challenges and important things are they facing um, that technology potentially could enable. And we decide we distilled that down to sort of three or four key areas in terms of perhaps health, social care, um, pub, you know, public sector assets and, and, and getting people back on the high street. And then we actually then went out for an innovation call to organisations to come forward to, I, you know, specifically address those challenges. And that's important when we're looking at organisations moving from testing phase to actually market demand phase, because we've we've identified the market demand and hopefully there can be you know you know commercially viable product at the end of that and there are good news stories we've got some on our smart cities program has already um got a um contract with AWS um for example so the whole thing is actually enabling organizations and seeing that that route to market um in terms of the green um um innovation challenge which we like I say launched at the beginning of the year, very much aligned to West Midlands 2041 and the ambitions for the region um, to tackle climate change. And that's just some of the areas in terms of uh, that we, I won't uh, read the slide out, but some of the areas that we addressed with um, that particular challenge. Um, and again, this is a super busy slide, but this is just a, a, some 10 of the companies, I believe, that went through that first innovation challenge and looks gives you a bit of a, an example of some of the things they looked at from, you know, remote monitoring of wind turbines um, from our you know, offices in Birmingham to the Orkney Islands to tracking people and tracking parcels and again, mm -hmm. back to connectivity and autonomous vehicles. We looked at, you know, hubs um, um, in, in, in particular areas. And so, you know, a lot of information that I can share the slides after I can share, the, I can share a lot more information about our alumni of organisations that have worked with us. Um, but to end there, I think the important thing is not, you know, who we've worked with now, but actually who we want to work with going forward. And, you know, we've got great ambitions to continue looking at 5G, but also, you know, actually there's a lot of other technologies, you know, future wireless tech connectivity that we want to look at because it's actually what's right for your organisation, what's right for a particular challenge. Um, so, yep, su super keen to hear from anyone that wants to know more and, and details are there and really conscious of time. So I will pause. Oh, thank you, Leslie. Thank you, That's Leslie. great. And um, obviously, yeah. we'll share the slides, but it's great to see how businesses can benefit from you know um, looking at five G. So thank you for that presentation. Thank you. So now over to our final speaker, Bernadette McCulloch, who is a sustainability consultant on the council's green business program, who's going to be telling us all why it's now time to go green. So over to you, Bernie. Thanks, Denise. Can everybody see that? My yeah. Slides. Yeah, yeah. Brilliant. Okay, so I think we're running over time, so we'll try and make this quick. I'm going to skip through loads of my slides, but essentially, you've been asked why it's time for businesses to go green and what regional support is out there. So, I'm a business energy advisor with Coventry City Council and I work on the Green Business Programme. Um, just a little bit of um, context. So, businesses we've been speaking to recently, SMEs are sort of feeling that they're coming out of uh, the challenges that COVID has, has set and they're coming out the other side of that now and becoming ready to invest. So, we've got a huge number of increased referrals, but also older businesses that we've previously engaged with who've been on hold because of COVID are now coming back wanting to invest in energy efficiency technologies. And that's partly stemmed from a concern about rising energy costs. There's been lots of media coverage around that, which you can see from the, the uh, headlines there. Um, and there's also a, a prediction that's going to be a big price hike in April next year. So people are really worried about that and wanting to make a difference for their business. So there is a main driver of cost savings, but there's also the softer benefits of wanting to improve your image and helping to win bids and tenders and that kind of thing. And uh, COP26 has also increased the overall awareness of that agenda, lots and lots of media coverage um, around the environmental uh, impacts. Um, 
and there's been a real interest in renewable technologies as well from businesses so um, particularly heat pumps and solar pv so we work on the green business program that's for the coventry and warwickshire region but just for any businesses on might, might be on the call from other parts of the west midlands there are other areas as well such as the birmingham black country and sully hole scheme which is very similar um, that's our basic eligibility so in order to be eligible to join the program and the aims of the scheme is to help businesses to reduce carbon help them to access grant funding to pay for energy efficiency measures and to provide a advice and guidance around that and recommendations it's a grant funding of up to fifty thousand pounds as a maximum and that's a 40 percent contribution towards the cost of work you've always got to find 60 percent match and we have a target to meet that we must try and save at least one ton of carbon for every thousand pound of grant spent we carry that out through an energy audit, which is a compulsory part of the process. That's worth £840. We do it free of charge for businesses. We do a carbon saving calculation and trying to help you to uh, maximise the energy savings that you can from the recommendations that we make. I won't go through the highlights of what we've achieved so far. Um, the report is to assess your current energy use look at your cost and your carbon outputs and help to find the greatest efficiencies but there's no obligation to follow all the recommendations that we make but they just give you a picture of where your business is now where it could be and then you can then make a business decision on the payback periods that we provide on which measures you want to take forward to a grant application those are the sorts of areas that we look at in terms of recommendations so building fabric as well as technologies I won't go through the case studies because that's probably the longest part of the presentation. Um, just quickly, our, our five top tips for energy management is to take regular meter readings. And that sounds really obvious, but people don't. And you quite often get overcharged for your meter readings, for your bills. Um, or ask your energy company or your energy broker to get smart meters fitted to save you having to take the readings. Check your bills. People, businesses quite often get overcharged for daft thing like VAT you know they have might have different tariff rates for different meters or different buildings with the same energy company and things like capacity charges for large electricity users if you've already got a building management system or smart meters you know use that information that's what it's there for to help you to identify any wastage and then you can make decisions about what to reduce what to remove how to what equipment needs to be replaced and helps you focus and target your investment accordingly and then finally, just consider switching, which you can do if you've got an energy broker, obviously you'd be using them anyway. But if not, there's lots of really good advice out there for businesses on how to do that, to compare the market or even to negotiate with your current supplier about to be on a better deal. Another positive part of our programme is we have a green business network and sort of well, that's all the benefits there. But the main one is really the green business directory. So it's one, it's showcasing your own business, but also you can use it to procure work through that directory so that's a really useful tool and just to point out it's not just about green business there's lots of other funding resources out there um, there's innovation grants um, business support for capital investment there's support around if you want to go for accreditations it's all sorts um, low carbon programs but in terms of rather than listing them all here if you want to have one port of call that can advise you and signpost you to everything that's available your local growth hub is probably the best the best bet and then finally, just this is how to get in touch with us. So if you want free energy advice, energy audits and help to get funding, that's how to get in touch with us. And the slides will be shared after this, that you'll be able to get the details there. That's it from me. Thank you. Thanks, Bernie. Thank you very much.